In this video, we're going to cover some very practical tips that will help you shoot better martial arts content. This video is sponsored by the Professional Photographers of America. Join a community of over 35,000 photographers, find equipment insurance, education, and business tools made specifically for small business owners like you. Now, I've been shooting martial arts content for a number of years. That includes MMA, boxing, Muay Thai, and a little bit of Jiu Jitsu. The biggest thing that helped me kind of understand and shoot a little bit better was actually training it in myself for about four years. Now, obviously, that might not be you, but we're going to try and share some of that with you today as well. Now, everything that we're going to be talking about here mostly relates to when you're shooting for your clients inside of a training facility like a gym, but we will touch on live events, which is something else you might be capturing as well towards the end. Firstly, shooting handheld. Now, I think it goes without saying that martial arts in general is a very high paced, fast action sport. It can go from stationary to explosive in a matter of milliseconds. Whatever it is that you're filming, you need to try and make the viewer feel like they're kind of there. When you're using a gimbal, it's going to be really smooth smooth and that's not what it's like to actually train in that kind of environment. Shooting handheld is going to be a lot more jarring, a lot more fast paced, there's going to be a lot more camera movement, it might be a little bit confusing at times. That's more like what it's actually like to be training in that environment. That's why handheld is a way better way to shoot than with a gimbal. So let's talk about camera angle and movements. Now, if you haven't trained in martial arts, it might be a little bit harder to understand what's going on when you start filming. You don't know the rules. You don't know why someone is walking forwards and suddenly backwards and forwards again off to the side and now you're in their way. This is gonna take time to learn and I would recommend that you stand a little bit further back when you first start until you start getting a little bit more of an understanding of what's going on and you know that you're not gonna be in the way. Otherwise, you're on the high risk of getting kicked, punched, or just generally being in the way and you don't want to be in the way. I like to get in as close as I possibly can while holding the camera kind of like this. I will have a handle on each side normally attached to a cage. We'll talk more about gear in a bit. I've got a nice wide leg stance with my elbows in. There's a few different typical movements that I like to do when I'm filming people that are training. Let's say there's two people. I might like to get a side angle of them a little bit wider, but then get in a little bit closer and have a POV angle behind the one person, maybe of the person holding pads, then flip back around again and get the POV of the other person who is now kicking or punching the person that's holding the pads. I also like to do little circles around people slowly to mimic any kind of movement that they might be doing as well. You'll find that a lot of fighters tend to circle each other. That is that's something that they're taught. And if you can circle the person at the same time or go in the opposite direction, it creates a nice kind of movement between the two people moving. So that's something to try as well. Generally speaking, in terms of the height of the camera, there's a couple of different ways that I'll approach filming. It's either at eye level of the people that are training or from below to get those kind of like hero shots high angle, you don't want to be doing that. Now there's a really great tip I can give you when it comes to filming people for a specific style of shot that just looks really good. And when you see it back, you'll be amazed by how good it looks. Basically, you're going to be following the movement with your camera of a punch or a kick. Now this can be applicable to someone who's training on their own, maybe hitting a heavy bag, or if they're with someone as well. Basically, what you're going to be doing is, let's say someone is throwing a punch. So let's say I throw my cross because I'm a southpaw, it's my left power hand. I'm going to throw that punch and then come back again. What you're looking to do is, you're going to be focused on them but as they throw that punch, you're going to be following with your camera the movement of the punch and then back in again. And it's not going to be slow. It's going to be more like this when you do it literally like that quick. That's what it's going to look like. It looks really funny for me to do that here, but you'll see what I mean when you look back at it afterwards. It's just a really effective way to capture what it's like for that person to be punching and then taking that punch back in again as a viewer. You do this for punches, for elbows, for kicks, for knees, anything where there's something explosive, some explosive movement happening. So the camera is just always following the movement and it's much more immersive as a viewer. Definitely don't overdo using this, throw it in here and there, but it's a really nice little tip for you. And another tip for you when it comes to watching or anticipating things that are likely gonna happen, because it's very, very fast paced, watch the center of the chest. This is where most movements come from. If they're gonna throw a punch, the chest is going first. The chest will go and then the arm will follow. Same for the other way, chest will go, then the arm will follow. If they're gonna throw a kick, chest will go, then the hip, then the leg. So watch for the center of the chest. When you start to train, that's one of the first things they teach you. Don't look at the person in the eyes and the head or anything like that. Look here, right at the sternum. Now, if you're filming someone that's a little bit more experienced, it's gonna be harder because they're better at hiding it. They're also a lot faster, so by the time you watch the chest movement happen, is the kick or punch has already happened. But that is something to look for when you first start filming people. Remember how I said that training in this first really helped me understand how to film it a little bit better? I think this applies to anything. If you film a sport or a hobby or something and you understand it, you're likely to be able to film it a little bit better than the average person.
This video is sponsored by a non-profit which very much aligns with what you and I do, which is making content for yourself and for others. And they're called PPA, the Professional Photographers of America. And if you are new to this world or you've been doing it a while, they have some things to offer which if you're a member, will be very useful for you and your business. You have equipment insurance to cover you up to $15,000 if anything happens to your equipment. They can also help you out with data loss recovery, something you never wanna have to go through. If you have an unhappy client and you think legal fees might start to be involved, you just file a claim and help is on the way. They can also help with the very boring thing, which is contracts. You don't think you need them, but believe me, you do to protect yourself, to protect your client. It helps you all the legal jargon and clauses, things you just don't wanna have to learn about. And they're completely customizable for your business. You can download them and tailor them exactly how you want them. Now, I very briefly glossed over all of the things that they offer. There is a ton more on there as well. If you wanna learn more, if you click on the link down below, that'll take you directly to their website. And if you end up signing up, that'll actually get you an exclusive discount as well. Thank you, PPA, for sponsoring this video and continuously supporting the channel. Let's talk about gear, because this can make a big difference in terms of the video that you get. Now, I've already said that my choice is to shoot handheld, but what about lenses and other gear that you might potentially be wanting to use? Now, I personally think that the 24 millimeter focal length is perfect for shooting martial arts. You can get in nice and close while maintaining a nice wide field of view that really isn't distorted in any way. Now, I use the 24 mil G Master F1.4. There's a bunch of more affordable options out there as well. And 24 to 70, if you have one of those, that's pretty much gonna do the same thing anyway. Now, although that lens is an F1.4, the one I use, I'm not going down to F1.4. I'm rarely going below F2.8 with you, to be honest, because things are fast paced. I do use autofocus a lot and I rely on it a lot. When that eye locks on, it's perfect, it works really well. But if you shoot in shallow, you run the risk of it potentially not being in focus. I find F2.8 is the sweet spot. Sometimes I'll go a lot higher though as well if I wanna capture what's going in in the background and just have less of that like cinematic -y depth of field look that everyone just seems to get when they start shooting. You can go higher. F5.6 isn't a crime. Now you absolutely need some form of microphone on top of your camera. If your camera doesn't record audio for whatever reason, you need to have an external recorder to capture some form of audio. Unless of course it's just like music that you're editing it to, but generally speaking, the sound effects you're getting from martial arts really give you that extra depth to it. The real sounds involved are things like punching different parts of the body, like the sound of punching someone in the head is different to the sound of punching someone in the chest or the stomach. Punching a pad sounds completely different. Fast paced breathing, slower paced breathing, grunts, groans. Those are all like really raw sounds that you don't always get in other sports because you're much further back. If you're in the action, nice and close, but like a 24 mil, and you can capture those sounds, absolutely capture them. It's way harder to foley all those sounds in post, and it's also a lot of work to do that too. So save yourself the time now, capture audio. Now I find a monitor, an external monitor, pretty key to capturing martial arts. Five inch or even a seven inch I find a little bit better. I use this Feel World seven inch monitor here that I will link below for you. Same with all the other gear that I've talked about in this video. And there's a couple of reasons for wanting to use a monitor opposed to the little camera screen for whatever camera it is that you're using. Number one, I like to shoot handheld as I've already made very clear and this adds weight to it. When you add weight to a handheld rig, you get less of those little micro jitters that you might see and you get more of the smoother, more fluid, natural looking handheld movement that you typically associate with seeing handheld in movies and that kind of thing. And make sure if you do have any form of digital stabilization turned on, like with Sony, the active, turn it off, get that gone. You don't want it on. You want it as raw as you possibly can get it when it comes to handheld. The other reason for wanting to use a monitor is a lot of the movements you're doing that we've already talked about, they're very very fast paced. That's a tiny little screen there. To be moving this around so quickly, it becomes very, very hard to see what's actually going on, what you have in frame there. So when you have a bigger monitor, it's much easier to see things when it's moving around really fast. Also, another reason is these are on hinges and these really aren't designed for fast paced stuff. So if you're shaking your camera around a ton, after a while, these are going to start to wobble. The hinge is going to become a little bit looser, weaker. I wouldn't just use or rely on the hinge of those. Also add a cage to your camera because that allows you to properly mount. And I say properly mount, what I mean by that is don't use, when you buy camera monitors, they always come with the little cold shoe mounts that go on the top here. Don't use that. Although it may seem tight, it's gonna come off after a while, believe me, especially when you're shaking the camera around, throwing it around. So make sure you use a cage on your camera. That way you can properly mount it with a proper monitor mount, something like a NATO rail. They're gonna be way better, way stronger than mounting it to the cold shoe on the top. Another really useful thing for you to buy is a handle. Typically speaking, a wider grip on a camera is gonna be more stable. Add at least one handle to one side of the cage. You can go two as well if you want to. Instructional videos. Now it's very likely that when you're working with a gym to film content for them, they're gonna want 
want to create instructional videos because that's really great content for them to put out for both their members and for other people to find out about the gym. This is typically where a coach or an owner of the gym is instructing people on how to do techniques, working with someone else, proper way to wrap their hands, proper way to throw a punch, those kinds of things. Super popular for gyms to put out this style of content these days, especially with short form. Now, the easiest way to approach this is with a two camera setup. You want a wide shot showing everything going on inside the frame, but also a handheld or at least something on a camera on a fluid head that you can quickly zoom in and out to show specific things that are happening in a little bit more detail than you would be able to otherwise see in a wide shot. What do I mean by this? Well, maybe where you hold your hands when you're protecting yourself. In a wide shot, it's going to be harder to see. If you have a handheld rig or a camera on a fluid head that you can zoom in with like a 24 to 70 or 7200 you can zoom in see exactly where the hands are those are things that you want to be able to show in a little bit more detail a little bit closer for people this then allows you to cut between both those angles in the edit also audio an extremely important factor in these demonstration instructional style videos the person talking is talking about what it is that they're doing the right movements to make the right technique cross the top of his knuckles okay all right, so I'm gonna tie that in four times. One. You need to make sure the audio is captured correctly and you need at least two sources. You need a source on the camera, like a shotgun mic or something like that. But more importantly, you need a lapel mic on the person who is talking. Why? Well, let's say it's a jujitsu instructional video. Now they may start standing up and the audio from the camera going into the shotgun mic, that's completely fine. But it's likely that they're gonna end up on the floor and it's likely they're gonna be talking away from you. Like this. And now we can hear that the audio is suddenly no good coming from the camera. So you need a lapel mic on that person talking to make sure that you can capture it no matter which angle they're facing, no matter where they are in the frame. 45 degrees to my right. Cutting it, my partner turns into me, I'm gonna go cross and then a big switch kick. Now if you have someone that can boom for you, obviously that's even more beneficial. They can hold it right above wherever the people are, but a lot of people, if they're solo creators, they're not gonna have that luxury. And you can't just leave a boom mic set up somewhere because they're gonna be moving around and they might not be under where the boom mic is and then it's useless audio again. Let's talk about live events. Live events in itself is a completely different beast. You have your own sets of challenges. It's completely different shooting in a facility or a gym. You can't get as close to the action. You're not allowed to be in the ring with them or in the cage with them because there's obviously two people fighting. Now, my preference to shoot live events is I don't like to do like the generic coverage style. That's not what I like to do. I like to do like more of the doc style, which results in highlight videos that you could then share on social media or you could make a little video of that can go on their website to promote an event or something like that. So that's what we're going to be talking about in terms of how to get some better shots and some things to watch out for because it's hard to shoot live stuff. Now, if you're shooting this, obviously you're being paid by a client to work at the event and odds are you probably have it, but make sure you have ringside or cage side access. And that's going to mean you are either below the cage, like on the floor or below the boxing ring, because typically they're elevated so that the, the audience can see, or it might mean that you are able to get up a little bit higher and shoot over the top. More often than not, you're gonna be on the ground level looking up. So you wanna be using a zoom lens here, a 24 to 70 or even the 35 to 150 from Tamron. Those are gonna be perfect choices for shooting live events. You need to be able to get in and out quickly by zooming in and out of the action. Handheld is gonna be way easier than shooting on sticks with a fluid head, especially if the action suddenly goes from one side to the other side and they're now right in front of you and you have your camera on a fluid head and you just can't get the view you need. Whereas with handheld, you just move the camera to wherever you want it to be, zoom out and you're good. Or if it's still too close, you can take a step back. If it's on a tripod, you can't do that as quick. So handheld again. Now with boxing, it's a little bit easier because if you're on the ground looking up, you can shoot through the ropes, under the ropes, through the middle rope. It's much easier. With MMA, there's a cage and that cage does pose a big problem if you've never shot with a cage before. So you gotta shoot through the cage. How are you gonna do that? Basically, you need a lens that has an aperture of at least f2.8. Higher than that, it's not gonna work well. You need to get as physically close as you can with that lens to the physical cage itself. Now, the last event I was just shooting at, I was using the FX6. You obviously don't need to use this camera, but just as an example, I use the 24 to 70. This needs to be as close to the cage as you can get it. Now, that means you might have to use a really short shotgun mic and maybe even put the mic inside of the holder a little bit further back. So you're actually covering part of the mic, but that's okay. It's still gonna pick up from the front there. If this is sticking out further, the mic's gonna restrict you from getting close enough to the cage. You need to get it to the point where the lens is 
it can't focus on the cage. It's too close because of the lens's minimum focus distance. That's what you need in an ideal situation. Now you might not always be able to do that. So you might find yourself having to switch to manual focus. Autofocus will work, but you might find that it jumps back and forth from the cage and then you miss out on some action. You can also shoot in autofocus with manual focus assist on, which is in Sony cameras these days. And that's where it will be in autofocus mode, but you can just turn the manual focus ring to take over control. And then if you focus on the fighter, it will stay locked on on the fire. So F2.8, as close as you can to the cage, get past the minimum focus distance point and use manual focus assist if you have it. Another big tip for live events, especially if you're making highlight reels, is to capture details as well. What I mean by that is not just what is going on inside the ring or the cage. Judges, commentators, people in the crowd, capture all that stuff as well. And you might be thinking, well, how am I gonna do that and capture what's going on in the action there in the ring or the cage if I'm just on my own? Well, there's always gonna be fights that are really good that you know are gonna have bits that you're gonna use for your highlight reels in. And there might be some fights that aren't as exciting or interesting or in the breaks between the rounds. Flip the camera back and then capture your your shots then that you want to use as your details. And you can just cut those in with the fights you are going to be using the highlight clips from. Odds are people aren't going to know that that shot that you have of that person looking or shouting or screaming or clapping, that wasn't from the actual fight that you're showing. They're not going to know tricks of the edit. So that's something that will be really helpful for you when it comes to shooting live events as well. That is it for this video. Thank you for watching. Hope you like this one. I'll see you in the next one. Take care.